So far on Vintage Geek, we've talked about a lot of the classic computer models, the Apple II, the TRS-80, Commodore PET, but one brand we haven't talked about yet is Atari. I'm excited to be able to play with an Atari 800 today. Back in 1979, Atari officially entered the personal computing game with the Atari 400 and the Atari 800. Now there's an immense amount of information online about both of these systems, and if you'd like to learn more about the history of these units, I strongly encourage it. But we're not going to cover that here on Vintage Geek, because I want to play with an Atari 800. Now when I was a kid, I actually had an Atari 400 that I picked up somewhere, I believe it was a garage sale or maybe a flea market, and I was pretty fascinated by it at the time. Now the 400 had the membrane keyboard, and in my case, I didn't get anything with it. It didn't come with a single cartridge, didn't come with any kind of a tape machine or a disk drive, so there was really no nothing I could do with it other than type in the built-in word pad on it, so I quickly abandoned the machine and put it on a shelf and kind of forgot about it. But revisiting things for the Vintage Computer Museum and getting a chance to go back and play with these classic systems, I really wanted to play with one of these Atari machines. Now today I'm playing with the Atari 800 because it's the improved model, it has 48K of RAM, it has some other great features like a full motion keyboard, that uh, is superior to the membrane style keyboard and it also just has a little bit better performance overall. I've never touched one of these machines in my life so this is going to be a first time and I'm excited to do it here on Vintage Geek. I want to take a minute to talk about the machine itself and my first impressions of it. Now when we did get this particular Atari 800 I was really pleased that it came with the original box and also everything was in the box pretty much as it would have been from the factory so unboxing this was kind of a treat and being able to kind of have that first experience was a lot of fun. Now having the machine out in in front of me, the first things that I noticed, first of all, it's a really clean example of an Atari 800. I'm very pleased with the condition of it. But secondly, I really like the overall construction of this. It has a nice weight to it. It's got uh, kind of this textured plastic all around that's this brown plastic, but it looks nice. The keyboard is great. Um, just this, you know, the full motion keys. Obviously, compared to the Atari 400 with its membrane keyboard, is a completely different experience. I think this would be much more apt to doing, you know, word processing and coding and things like that. So I'm excited to use that. One of the keys that's interesting on this Atari 800 is the Atari key itself. Now I know a lot of you watching this video are probably going to say, "Oh, of course, the Atari key." I actually don't know what the Atari key does because, again, the only experience I have with Atari is the Atari 400. So I'm looking forward to learning about that today. Overall, the the rest of the keyboard design is pretty standard. You've got your standard row of numbers. You do have a backspace key, which is nice compared to some of the other systems we used where I was struggling to find that. I like these uh, buttons on the right. Now, I'm not sure what all of these are going to do yet. We do have a system reset button. There's an option button, select and start. I assume the start is to run a program. Power LED, nice uh, bright illuminated LED there, which is nice. Now, if we go above the keyboard, this particular model has two cartridge slots. Now, I read online that the right cartridge was very seldom used. Obviously, most things would go in the left cartridge. The 400 only had one slot. I'm anxious to learn a little bit more about that. But again, I'm impressed with the overall design. I like the fact that it's got this kind of metal surround around on the cartridge slots. It just feels beefy and it feels really well built. The Atari 800 does have a chroma and luma output for the video, which actually makes a much nicer picture on a monitor like the Commodore that we have here that does have those types of inputs. It's a much clearer picture. One thing we noticed while we were sitting here with the Atari 800 plugged in and on for a long period of time is that it appears it has an early version of a screensaver. The actual colors on the screen start changing if you leave the computer idle for too long, which is pretty interesting. I read that the Atari Atari 800 was originally sold for a price of about $1,000, which in its time was a heck of a lot of money. It also explains why the build quality is so good on this and why probably I'm so impressed with the overall construction and how it's made. It looks like this particular Atari 800 actually sold a little bit later on because the price was marked down to $598, which was a pretty significant markdown for the original $1,000 price tag. Can you believe it? There's an Atari price to fit your budget. The Atari 800 now priced at $199.95 after a $100 rebate from Atari. Now I want to spend a little bit of time today doing some basic programming on it. We do have the basic cartridge and get a feel for the Atari 800, its performance and how it looks. Like other computers we've covered here on Vintage Geek, the Atari line actually requires a separate cartridge to load to run basic. 
we have that cartridge. It's the Atari 400 800 basic cartridge. So we're going to load that in and then we're going to uh, type a program from the book. I like the fact that uh, if you do open the cartridge door, it, it does kill the machine. I suppose that's a safety feature. I'm just going to turn it off to be doubly sure before I actually put the cartridge in. All right, we've got our ready command, ready to start entering some code. Now for this particular program, I've chosen the seagull over ocean sample code. Create a seagull, make it make some sounds, make it fly over the ocean. I'm, I'm game to see what we can do with this. I'm curious how long it's gonna take to type with this particular keyboard. We're gonna give that a shot now. Might be a good point to note that the lower case function on this, you actually have to throw it into lower case mode. It's kind of the opposite of modern computers. Instead of having a caps lock, it's like a lock on lower, which is kind of interesting. This is very challenging for me because now it's forced everything into lower case. So I'm having to hold shift and some of the keys are not really cooperating as well as I was hoping. So it's uh, making this a little bit longer process than I had anticipated. That's an interesting feature. It actually tells you an error in a single line of code. That's really cool. So the writing code experience on the Atari 800 is pretty good overall. There's some keys on this particular Atari 800 that were not registering very well, so I kind of had to play with them and tap them a bunch of times to get them to register, but then they started behaving a little bit more predictably, so I assume it's probably just because it sat for so long between uses. Now we've got the program coded in and ready to run here, so we're going to give this a try. Now according to the book, this program combines graphics and sounds. The sounds are not pure sounds, but simulate the roar of the ocean and the gull's tweet. The graphic symbols used to simulate the goal could not be printed on the line printer, so they actually put on the page the V dash dash. I don't know if that's actually a letter V, although I guess it could be just a symbol. Maybe that's why they couldn't do it. So it turns out that there was some something in the book that told us what the symbols were and how to create them. I just skimmed past that the first time. Also found the error in my logic. I had put one of the loops in twice by mistake. I jumped ahead in the code. So I think I've got it running now without errors. If I can just get the little seagull to show up, I think we'll be in good shape. <laughs> All right, that's pretty cool. Got a little seagull flying around randomly. Well, this is a pretty nice little relaxing ocean scene we have here. We got some ocean sounds. We got the little seagulls squawking. That's pretty cool. I like it. We've executed a basic program now on the Atari 800 and worked out pretty well. I'm, I'm pleased with the result. Now we're gonna try another one of the cartridge games that we have. Now we did a, a music program for the Interact in a recent video and thought that was pretty neat with the music scale and everything, but obviously we didn't go too far into depth with it. One of the nice things about the Music Composer program for the Atari is that we have the full documentation and box for it. So we're gonna actually go through a sample today and kind of see what the program is all about and some of the features and how it can work. So I've got my Music Composer cartridge here ready. We're gonna put this in and give it a shot. All right, we've got Atari Music. Looks like we've got a menu here. Now, I am gonna follow the book on this because uh, I know a little bit about music, but only enough to be dangerous. So I feel it'd be good to start with a sample in the book and see what we can do with it. And we're gonna start with the first phrase of the music. This program apparently is to write, row, row, row your boat. So we're into some pretty advanced stuff right now. It says, enter the edit music command and then erase all previous music in the phrase. Even though there may not have been any previous music entered, it's still a good idea to clean the slate so there won't be any surprises. All right, so we're gonna hit E for edit music. It gives us the edit music menu. We're gonna hit P for phrase and erase yes. Now oh, this is a nice display here. We've got uh, color bands and we've got the music scales up here. So let's see what we can do now. The bottom line of the display asks SMI note and we're gonna enter C4Q. So what that means is that it's middle C, a quarter note, or in terms a computer can understand, C natural of octave four, a quarter note. Okay, cool. Now we're gonna do CQ. Oh, interesting. So you don't have to give it the octave number again because it already knows you're in that octave. The next note, the third note, and the first measure of the first phrase is the dotted eighth note, which is C E. 
Each time you enter the note, the computer displays and plays all notes. And the next note, the last note of the first measure, is a quarter note, but enter it as an eighth note so you can go back and correct your error. E -E. Now we can correct that by hitting control and back. Oh, interesting. So the, the black bar, I didn't realize that at first. So the black vertical bar is where you are in the actual music piece, and that's what you're working on note-wise. Interesting. Nice. All right, so we're gonna do five notes of the second measure. And that does get me gently down the stream. So looking at the book, it looks like the next phrase has triplets, which it phrases as a problem. When the computer played the measure after you entered the last note, it did not display the first 11 notes. It played all 12 notes, but only displayed the last one. The screen was full, so it just tucked them away. If you want to see the notes, use the editing key to move the cursor back. Pretty self-explanatory, but I like the fact that they cover that. Okay, so it's just got scrolling built in. That makes sense. And we got five notes here. All right, so now we're gonna see what our row, row, row your boat sounds like all put together. The computer played phrase one and phrase two together. You want to hear them played one after another. For this, you need to change the arrange program. So if we go to A for arrange, voice number one. So we want to add a third step to play phrase two. Add P to add a phrase, and we're gonna add phrase two. Play phrase one and play phrase two, one after the other. We're gonna go back to the main menu. We'll see if we've got a full song now. Yay! <laughs> it looks like you can do a lot with this. You can go on in this sample and create a repeating chorus of Row, Row, Row Your Boat. I'm not gonna go into that today, but uh, it was fun putting together the initial melody. It seems pretty advanced with the things you can do. It takes a little bit of learning though. There's definitely uh, its own learning curve for the program, but pretty impressed overall. Going into the game side of the Atari 800, we do have this game called Submarine Commander, a submarine patrol simulator to hunt and destroy enemy shipping. Your mission is to destroy all enemy merchant shipping in the Mediterranean waters. You have sonar to help you find them when you are submerged. If you're attacked, you can dive deep Deep, not too deep or the hole will crack, and try to dodge the depth charges, then you can rise to periscope level for another attack on the convoy. But check the instruments for your oxygen level, fuel, battery charge, depth under your keel, and watch out for enemy destroyers, or it may all end in disaster. This sounds like there's a lot of moving parts, and I can imagine that I'm probably not going to do super well at this, but uh, I'm going to give it a try anyway. We do not have the original Atari controllers, or joysticks rather, with us, so we're going to try our Spectre video controller from a different system. I don't know if this has the right pinout, so we're going to find out. I noticed that it automatically selected my skill level. Now, granted, I would have picked one on my own, but uh, I think it's a little bit rude that it just assumed that I was a skill level one, you know? All right, we've got a map. Now, unfortunately, this game had no instructions. So, I see some things moving. Okay, so the joystick is working. We got a timer running. We got the depth going on here. I wonder if there's a manual for this online. So while trying to find the instructions for this particular game, we let the game run, and it turns out that if you do leave it run for a long enough period of time, you run out of air and die. So our first uh, mission was a failure. <laughs> We found the manual for this game online so we can actually figure out what we're doing. Apparently for the speed, you type a speed from one to nine. That's why I couldn't move anywhere. You can type zero to stop, press B to surface rapidly. That uses up valuable air. You can crash dive with C. That takes control from the joystick and locks the submarine into a dive. You can press Y to pause the game. That's actually pretty helpful because if we would have paused it, we wouldn't have died from losing our oxygen. And abort is finally the good use for the Atari key. It is to abort the mission. It looks like this game pretty complex, so I'm probably not going to get into a large level of depth here, but maybe we can do a little bit of movement, see if we can blow up some submarines. All right, we've got our map here. The black dots are our enemies. We are the white cross on the map. Let's hit like five to start moving. Are we moving? Okay, so the torpedo thing didn't really do anything. This must just be the sonar. I'm not sure what I just did, but it looked cool. I mean, it says we're going at top speed, but I don't really see 
what's happening on the map here. Let's go to zero and we'll just stop, I guess. So it turns out Submarine Commander is definitely beyond my skill level. Seems like there's a lot of depth to the game even after reading through the manual. I tried for quite a while to just kind of chase around one of the enemy ships and I never could get close enough to actually get one within the sonar where I could fire torpedoes or anything. But overall the gameplay just seemed a little bit slow and uh, not terribly interesting. But again, this isn't really my type of game so I'm probably not the best person to judge. Overall, I really like the system. It's a nice solid piece of computing hardware using things like basic. I love the fact that it actually tells you the errors in a line of code before you move on. That is extremely helpful, especially compared to some of the other machines we've tried on Vintage Geek. Music Composer program was great. I really love that program and what it can do. It seemed to have a lot of advanced features and if you really got into it, I think you could compose some really neat pieces with the Music Composer program on the Atari 800. Submarine Commander wasn't for me, but it looks like it could be a solid game. Obviously the selection of games and titles for Atari is extensive. We have only barely scratched the beginning of the surface of the Atari iceberg as it were here on the Vintage Geek channel. But this is really what I wanted to do today. Really wanted to see what the Atari 800 is all about. We have many Atari systems in the Vintage Geek Museum that we're going to be showing. So we're going to have more featured on the channel as time goes on, as well as some other pieces of software and trying different things like the floppy drive and the cassette drive. But I think this is a good introduction into the system. I'm glad I got a chance to play with it today. Hey, if you like what we're doing here on Vintage Geek, want to remind you, please like and subscribe. We noticed in the last video we put out that about 90% of you watched and are not subscribers so if just a few more of you would subscribe it would really help us out as we grow here we now have vintage geek t-shirts and merchandise available be sure to check out the link in the description for more information on how you can get a cool vintage geek shirt we don't actually have ours yet which is why i'm not wearing one yet but we're waiting for those to show up any day now and you can get yours too right on that site thanks for watching vintage geek today be sure to check out our other videos and we'll see you next time